Good morning, Kingdom Rise Church. I want to wish each and every one of you a happy Mother's Day. Make sure that you wish your mothers a happy Mother's Day. Make this day uh, memorable. Make it wonderful. Let's celebrate the gift of mothers, of motherhood, of the burden of the mother, the heart of the mother. This is a special day. So I just want to encourage each and every one of you to really love on mom today more than you usually do because I know that each and every one of us already love on our moms. And if mom has already passed on, then just know that now you, you get to be able to be a mother-like figure to other people, just bringing them to encouragement, to healing, to hope. We all have a role, just know that. And so I wanna welcome you on behalf of Kingdom Arise Church. My name is Pastor Ray, and we are so excited to have you here today to receive, to grow, to expect God to do new things in your life, new things in our lives. That's why we're tuned in. That's why we're connected. That's why we're gathered here today. So with that, I would love to begin this journey together with prayer. Abba Father, we just come before you today. We just surrender. We surrender our lives before you right now. Lord, I just ask that each and every one of us, Lord, we would stop being Martha's and we would just be Mary's right now, that we would just sit at your feet, Lord, that we would just find rest and come to peace. So many of us are wanting peace. We are so wanting hope, and yet we struggle with hopelessness. So many of us want to be better, and though we find ourselves in a season where we feel bitter. So Lord, we look to your better word, we engage ourselves, we submit ourselves, and we pursue you with all our hearts, mind, and souls, Lord. So love of God, Holy Spirit, minister to us now. Make those deposits, make those withdrawals, and leave us transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's where we're at. We are in a season of transformation. We are in a season where God no longer wants us to be transformers, but stay transformed. The evidence of our salvation, the evidence that you're not the same person has to become apparent, not just to yourself, but to the world around us, to our friends, our family, our church, our jobs, our communities, our businesses, every environment, every place we go, a touch of Jesus should be going and accompany each and every one of us. Now, I know that most of you are very aware that we are taking a journey through the Gospels. And this week we continue our, the journey in the Gospel or book of Luke. We're in chapter 9 and we're picking up in verses 18. And I already know the Lord had confirmed we're going to go through verses 18 through 27. I really believe that. So chapter 9, verses 18 through 27. So just be ready. Get your, get your Bibles out there. Get ready to take some notes. Just remember that those who take the best notes... They do the best on the test. That way you don't forget things. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but usually people, when they listen to anything, re what they retain is typically 20%. 20%. So if you write some notes, you won't forget them later. You'll be able to refer to them. You'll be able to pray on them, process on them, and allow the Holy Spirit to continue to minister to you beyond this message. So with that, as we step into verse 18, the first thing I would like to share is how we find ourselves in this place. What's going on in verse 18? Because remember, the Gospels are about Jesus, his life, his journey, the discipleship, his ministry, how it's established, how it's moved, the strategies, the templates that Jesus lays, the deposits Christ makes, and the instruction that Christ gives. And so last week we found ourselves in Christ. What does he do? He challenges his disciples to feed the sheep, to feed the multitudes. And they are faced with an overwhelming task. We're talking, the scripture says that there's 5,000 men in attendance. And it says that they have to be put into groups of 50. And they respond to Jesus and they say, Jesus, we don't have nothing other than those, what? Those two fish and those five loaves. How is this possible? And he's, they want, he, well, want Jesus to turn the people away. And Christ says, no, you feed them. Instead of fighting with Jesus, without reasoning with Jesus, without challenging Jesus, what do they do? They begin to divide the groups into 50. And if we look deeper into scripture, we find that there's 5,000 men. That does not take into consideration the women and the children. That means that potentially we're talking about 30 or 40,000 people that these 12 disciples are bringing into order. They're, bringing, they're organizing into groups of 50. There is noise, there's clatter, there's chatter, there's crying, there's clapping, there's all kinds of things. 
going on all over the place. And yet, what do they do? They just obediently obey Christ. They go about the work. They put their faith into action. And I really believe that that's what we're going to continue to see right now. Now, there's two thoughts I wanted to share that I didn't get to share last week. The first thought was this, five, or five loaves, two fish, number seven. Number seven speaks to the number of rest when the job is already done. And most of us Christians, the challenge is, is that we think that we have to perform. We think that we have to behave or live a certain way in order to be able to rest in God. And I want you to know that God's miracles do not work through you because of what you can do, but because you're resting, meaning you're trusting in God. So we find the seven uh, elements, right? Through the loaves and the bread. And then what happens? At the end of this miracle that every person is filled. So there's like a Holy Ghost buffet and there is a physical buffet of food. And there's, there's fragments that are gathered and 12 baskets are overflowing and every person is filled. There's leftovers and we find the number 12. What does 12 speak to? It speaks to government and administration. It speaks to order. And I want you to know that, that when you rest in God, order will follow. When you rest in God, you'll always be filled to overflow. There won't be lack. And so I just believe that we find this amazing uh, move of God, this amazing miracle, and now we're stepping into the very next scene. So that's where we find ourselves today. And we're picking back up chapter 9, verse 18. And it says, And it happened as he was alone praying, that his disciples joined him and asked them, saying, Who do the crowds say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist. But some say Elijah. And others say that the one of the old prophets has risen again. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Raised the third day. So we see here that he concludes this one thought with a prelude to what's going to come. The road ahead He's, he's, he's depositing, he's, he's recognizing that he's not just a visionary, but he is giving people the vision. He's giving his disciples, he's reminding disciples of what's to come. He's preparing them for the pain and the process as he goes and he, he walks into destiny's purpose. That's the truth for each of us today, is that we need to remind ourselves of God's promises and declare them over our lives, irregardless of what we feel, irregardless of what we see, irregardless of what people are saying. We have to stay more surrendered and more committed to God's promises than our personal pain. And that's the journey that we're all on today. So as we open up, it says immediately after the fragments are taken up, it says, and it happened. Understand that many times in our lives, that's how we find ourselves as seasons change. I, I oftentimes uh, re relay seasons to moments. Every season is determined or shifts through a moment. And it happens, speaks to a moment, a God moment, a moment where after this miracle, and it happened. So God moves in power, but now God wants to reveal something about himself. God doesn't do the miracle just to blow you away. He does the miracle to get your attention. He does the miracle to remind you of God's sovereignty. It reminds you of his providence. It reminds you that something greater than you is at work. So that we come in a place of reverence before God and it happens. He makes those deposits. All of a sudden we have these epiphanic moments, these aha moments, and we realize and we're ready to listen to what the Lord has to say. And so we find here that in this shift of seasons, there's a moment and it's, it's noted biblically as in that statement that says, and it happened What's happening in your life? What happened in your life? And are you focused on what God is doing in your life right now? Stay focused. Look ahead. Don't look down. Look up. And it says here, And it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him. 
And he asked them, saying, who do the crowds say that I am? So where do we find Jesus? This is ultimately one of Christ's greatest gifts to humanity is his, his personal intimacy with God the Father. Is he with a bunch of people all the time praying? No. Not that he doesn't want to do prayer meetings, but really what he wants to do is he wants to give God his undivided attention. The beauty of finding and setting apart time for God is that you allow yourself to hear his voice, to declutter and so that you're able to share your heart with God. You know, when you get alone, you're able to speak out loud. Uh, I've noticed as I get older, though I'm pretty young, <laughs> I've noticed that I like to speak out loud to God more. And when I hear what I'm saying, I recognize the condition of my heart. When I hear what I'm saying, I get to understand what's important to me, but I also have a real dialogue with God. It's not just the inside thoughts, it's not just the inside voices, but I get to speak things into the atmosphere. I really believe that so many Christians inadvertently become so timid that they don't speak the things that they need to speak to their lives, to God, to themselves. When you speak the word of God, you release life. We're carriers of power. Scripture says that, what, that, that both life and death are at the tip of our tongues. We have power in our tongues. When we don't speak things, we can't release things. When we can't release things, we can't establish things. When we can't establish things, we can't let things be birthed. We can't let things be resurrected. And we cannot allow God's transformational power to manifest. So each of us today, we need to engage God. Find that time alone, but speak, prophesy over yourself. Remind yourself whose you are. Remind yourself of the miracles that God did, but most importantly, what God still has to do, the road ahead. Ask God for the blueprint. Ask him for the roadmap. Ask him for those relationships. Ask him what he needs you to do so that you can be full of his power, full of his purpose each and every day of your life. So he's praying, and as he's praying alone, the disciples sneak up on him. They walk up to him. They find him. They know where to find him. You know why they know where to find him? Because he's disciplined. Because he's committed. He's devoted. He's steadfast. All of us today, with all the things going on in life, all the turmoil, all the chaos, all the different variables that seem out of our control, where do we run to find peace? Where do we go? The key is, is that all of us need to go back to the Father, Abba Father. And so they come and they find Christ speaking to Dad. And I just want you to know today that though it's Mother's Day, there's conversations with Dad that each of us need to have every day. Don't avoid those conversations. Don't sidestep those conversations. Don't deny God those conversations. Don't deny yourself intimacy with the Father. So they approach Christ and as they approach, he's ready to challenge them. He's ready to see where their revelation is at. Remember, when we do the miracle, or when the miracle happens, now God wants us to reflect. He wants to test for understanding. You know, the best learners, the best students are those people that after something happens, after there's adversity, after there's something going on, you take a moment to say la, to rest, to process, to reflect, and ask the Lord, what did I do right or what did I do wrong or what could I have done better? And did I glorify you in the process? And so Jesus is testing his disciples. He's testing his pupils. He's testing his brothers. And he's asking them what their revelation, what their understanding of who he is, who he is or who he is about to become to them really is. So he takes a temperature check. Amen? And so 19, it says, So they answered and said, John the Baptist... I don't believe it's any one person, but this is multiple people speaking at the same time. John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. So they're, they're processing and they're trying to give Christ the answer that they think that he wants to hear. And so what they're doing is they're regurgitating, they're recycling the buzz on the street. They're letting Christ know what people are saying, but Christ wants to know what they believe about who he is. And at 20, it says, and he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? He doesn't care. Not that he's not mindful of what the crowd thinks, but he cares about what God's sons think. He cares, like he does today, about what you think, about your journey, 
about what's going on in your life. Uh, not just what's going outside of your life, but what's going on in your heart. What's going on in your head. What are the voices that are speaking into your life? And how to silence those voices to be still and come to peace. I believe that one of the most one of the greatest gifts of the Holy Spirit is He is our comforter. And oftentimes we look to the Holy Spirit for power, but we don't come to the Holy Spirit for comfort. And so what happens is the body of Christ, what they do is that they become so entrenched in the doing of church that they don't know how to be. Remember, we're called to be human beings. We're not called to be human doers. Now, obviously, we're going to be required to do the word, right? To apply the word of God and walk in it. But the truth is, is that we have to learn how to pause. How do we do that? How do we know the will of the Father beyond reading scripture, beyond prayer? It's by being still and coming to peace. The one that gives us that peace is not Christ, but the person of the Holy Spirit. And so today, I encourage each and every one of you today, each of us, including myself, that we have to stop when things get crazy, when there's unknown variables that come in, when we're throwing a curveball and everything seems to be falling apart, or when things are doing well or doing good, are we still taking time and saying, come to peace. Lord, give me your peace. Be still. Be still, Pastor Ray. Be still, Ray. What is God trying to say? How does God want to use you? What does God want to do in you so he can do it through you? And I think that question is for all of us. And so Christ goes from asking them what the crowd say to asking what they believe. Because what other people think or what other people say does, should never determine what you personally believe. That's why you have to pray. That's why you have that relationship with God. That's why you need to spend time in the world because it's your belief system that God cares about. God cares about what you believe. What you believe matters. What you believe will determine the course of your life. What you believe will determine the condition of your heart, whether it's stony and hard or it's tender. The truth is, is that all of us have to guard our hearts and we have to fuel our hearts. How do we fuel our hearts? By getting in the word of God. How do we fuel our hearts? By giving the burdens that we carry to God. Each of us, as we minister to people and as we allow God to minister to us, we can't carry that yoke. We're called to have a burden to advance God's kingdom, but we're not called to carry and be compressed and under the pressure, under the duress of life circumstances. That's what we're called to give to God. Scripture says that when we're weak, he is made strong. So when you're weak, seek dad. When you're weak, ask yourself, be still. Be silent. Quiet thoughts, quiet voices, quiet images. Let me see your way, Lord. Let me find your peace so I can rest, so I can abide, so I can get refreshed, so I can get renewed. So I just encourage each and every one of us today to make sure that we're seeking the peace of God before we get consumed with the doing of God. Let's have that relationship. Let's make that time, just like Jesus, to spend time with the Father. And it says here that Peter now answers. Petra, right? We call him the rock, right? He builds the church. He's one of those key pillars in the New Testament. He's one of those key apostles that helps build the New Testament church after Christ dies, buried, and resurrects. And he says, the Christ of God. The Christ of God. That's what you and I have to understand, that Jesus is of God, sent by God, to help humanity, to heal humanity, to redeem humanity, to reconcile humanity, to take what is broken, the disconnect that the first Adam created in Eden. Now we have Jesus, the second Adam, and he's come to bring us victory, to take away our hopelessness and give us hope-filled lives. That's the journey you're on. That's the journey I'm on. And so he, Jesus, cares about his disciples. He wants to know if what they're learning or if they've learned anything at all. So all of us, we have to make sure that though we want to preach to people, though we want to speak to people, that we, that we really recognize the value that the Lord biologically has given us two ears and one mouth. We need to ask questions and then we have to listen. Are you listening to God? Are you listening to what's going on in your heart? 
Are you listening to your loved ones? Are you listening to your children? Are you listening to your community? Are you listening to your city? Are you listening to your nation? Are you listening to the groanings of the world? Are you sensitive to the needs of the world? God is raising in the end times a generation that will come to a place of awakening, that will usher in revival. But that first requires intercession. I really believe that it's such a tender time because God has put us all in a season where we find ourselves in this cave called COVID. Each of us to different degrees. And in this cave called COVID, what does God do? He's getting our attention. What does God do? He's reestablishing his end time bride from its very origins. He's taking us back to the book of Acts, where the, where the church is built in the home and the heart of the believers, not just in the walls of the church, but in the individual temples of the body of Christ. That's you and that's me today. He said to them, 20, but who do you say that I am? And Peter quickly answers, there's no delay here. There's no pause. There's no perplexing. There's no vexing. There's no confusion. Peter says, the Christ of God. Remember this, Jesus is sent by God on a mission. And can I tell you today that you and I were birthed by God, formed by God, fitted by God for a purpose, just like Jesus to be Christ-like, to, to advance the good news, to spread the word, to release the love of God and the purposes of God, to usher in the kingdom of God before he comes once again in victory. Amen? 21. And he strictly warned. Who are we talking about? Jesus, not Peter. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. Killed and raised on the third day. Killed and raised on the third day. I want to share a thought with you today. That so many times we find ourselves in difficult situations. So many times we want the God of mercy and grace. And can I tell you something? He's always been there. He was there before you were formed in your mother's womb. He's there today with you. His grace. Before you were saved, he had already known of your salvation. He already knew that one day you would, you, the walls of your heart would come falling down and the love of God would come crashing through. And I just want to encourage you today that Jesus had a purpose. Jesus knew that this was necessary. Jesus did not want to give revelation to his disciples ahead of time. He didn't want them to start speaking prophetic words or confirm prophetic words to the people ahead of its time. What does that mean? Jesus reminds me of the story of Joseph in this particular setting. That Joseph at that time, what did he do? He began to dream. He was a dreamer. So Christ is also a dreamer. He is the answer to dreams, to God's dream for you and I today. And so what happens? Jesus says, you know what? I, I'm glad, Peter, that you had the revelation, but button your lip. Don't share it. It's not time. Let me go ahead and sow seed. Let me love the sheep. Let me connect with the sheep. Let me invest in them and allow me to go through my process that this rejection is necessary. The rejection that you and I are going through today, and there may be more of it to come, that that's necessary. Jesus doesn't shrug it off. Jesus doesn't deny it. He wants it. And you and I today, we're not called to avoid our destiny in Christ. We're called to, to move ahead, to push forward, to prevail, to endure, to persevere. Today, you and I are called to move ahead. Let the dreams that God is depositing, let the visions that God has given process inside of you, process them with God. Write your dreams down. Journaling is such a powerful tool, and so many Christians miss the blessing, the treasure of having a journal. Write down the thoughts, write down the promises, write down the, the hidden things that God has given you. Don't give them to everybody. Joseph gave those things early and Joseph found much persecution. And I believe that some of that warfare was unnecessary. I believe that there's many Christians today that are experiencing unnecessary warfare because they're sharing dreams out of season. So each of you and each of us today, we must guard our hearts, guard our tongues, guard our words, guard the company and allow certain things to be birthed, certain things to be confirmed, certain things to be developed before we just open our mouths casually. It's so important for you and I today to get in sync with the Holy Spirit and allow God's divine process 
to mature, develop, and then manifest through our lives. So verse 22 speaks about suffering, death, burial, resurrection. It's all necessary. And I just want you to know that. That, you know, there's certain parts of our lives that need just to be, as we are called to be Christ-like, that are going to require us to suffer. I'm just telling you, that's part of humanity. God promises you eternity, but he didn't promise that you wouldn't suffer. That's another thing that we really need to understand as Christians, that suffering comes with your humanity. Pain comes with your purpose. The reality is pain doesn't discriminate. We all go through pain. We all go through some sort of form of suffering, but we have purpose and we know the purpose and we embrace the purpose. So what does Jesus do? He says, guys, I don't need you to share information ahead of its time. Allow me to develop this ministry. Allow me to spend more time with the Father. Allow yourselves to be developed in this process of discipleship. They don't know it's three years. He does. It's like three and a half years that he spends time and, and has intimacy with the disciples. And then he's going to go ahead and he's going, what's going to happen? He's going to suffer. He's going to be rejected. He's going to die. He's going to be buried and he's going to resurrect. Can I tell you that so many times as Christians, we don't want to go through suffering. We don't want to be rejected. We don't want to die, meaning die to maybe dreams, die to certain relationships, die to certain mindsets, and let those things be buried and allow God to resurrect new relationships, birth new opportunities, birth new hope. And if it's of God, understand something, God will resurrect it. And if it's not of God, it'll stay buried. The truth is, is that Christ's life process is what we're called to embrace. We're called to also be like Jesus. And it's so important that we understand that, that suffering comes with the process, that rejection, guess what? If you're rejected, praise the Lord, that means that you're on the right track. If you're suffering in some way, shape, or form, it's okay, the suffering is going to be for purpose. The suffering is for kingdom gain. Your pain is for kingdom gain. It's not just crazy life, my crazy life. This is bigger than that. It's bigger than you. It's bigger than me. It's Christ in and through you and I. It's Christ through the church. Christ with us. Christ in us. Christ through us. So things have to die. Things are going to be buried. But those the things that are of God will resurrect. And so we ask them to keep that secret under lock and key. Keep it in prayer. Keep it to themselves. It's not time for the world to get that revelation. And that takes us to verse 23. Verse 23 opens and says, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what, pro what, what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Till they see the kingdom of God. We, can I tell you a secret? <laughs> Maybe it's not a secret. But the kingdom of God doesn't manifest or is it going to manifest when Christ comes back a second time. It's when Christ leaves, when he ascends and the Holy Spirit descends that the kingdom of God manifest. The kingdom of God is available. The kingdom of God is real. The kingdom of God is here. And I want you to know that these people are living before Christ's death, birth, and resurrection. You and I, we live after it, right? We're living in the New Testament. We're, lifting at, we're living after Christ to live like Christ, to be like Christ. And I just want you guys to understand that, to realize that the kingdom of God isn't just for eternity. The kingdom of God is now. I really believe that the earth right now is experiencing groanings that the pain of humanity, the chaos of the world is causing an eternal growing. It's creating a vacuum in the heart of every single person on earth to fill it with God, to fill it with Jesus, to know Abba Father and to have the peace of the Holy Spirit. That's the vacuum that you're living in today. Those moments where you may feel alone, those moments where you feel like you're not enough, 
Scripture says that Christ is more than enough. And I want you all to be encouraged today. We have to remind ourselves that the kingdom is now, that the time to arise is now, the time to get up is now. Scripture says that though a righteous man fall seven times, he gets back up. What is stopping you from getting back up right now? What part of your life is dying? What part of your life have you given up on? What part of your life have you chosen to camp out in a valley called bitterness and not chosen to allow God to touch it so you can get better? What part of your life are you punishing or allowing the enemy to punish you in? Don't do that. That's not Christ's plan for your life. He wants to take you beyond the suffering. He wants to take you beyond the rejection. He wants to take you beyond the death. He wants you to take you beyond the burial. And he wants to introduce you to his resurrection power. The kingdom comes when Christ resurrects. And I want you to know that today, that when Christ is resurrecting parts of your life, those things can't be shaken. The things in your life that suffer, that are rejected, that are broken, that die, that are buried, Scripture says that the things, that things will be shaken, but the kingdom can't. Just know that, that just you as a son of God, as a daughter of God, though the world is shaking, you can't be because you find strength from an eternal God, from an all-powerful God, from a sovereign God, from a loving Father, from a Christ that was willing to go through everything and more than you could ever experience. Your God is the God of compassion. Your God is the God of the miraculous. Your God is the greatest teacher that has and ever will be. Our job is to be lovers. Our job is to go from bitter to better. Our job, our assignment, our calling is to spread the good news, not the bad news. I have a question for you today. When people get to know you, is it the bad news that they hear? Are you sharing the bad news? Are you sharing the problems of your life? Or are you sharing Jesus? Is Jesus real to people? Does, do people, when they come in contact with you, do they realize that there's something different about you? Do they feel the Jesus factor? We're called to spread the good news, but speaking the good news without living out the good news leaves a vacuum. It leaves an emptiness and there's an absence of power. Scripture talks about that situation. It says it is the impression of without the power within. We're called as the New, Ed, New, what, the New Testament and the end time church to not just look like Jesus, not just to smell like Jesus, not just to speak like Jesus, but to live like Jesus, to touch like Jesus, to cry like Jesus, to clap like Jesus, to embrace like Jesus, to trust God to do what only God can do, to walk in the impossible. That's the life that God's calling you and I to walk in today. So let's go back to the reality, the nuts and bolts of your and mine Christianity. Christ is speaking to his disciples and what does he tell them? What does he let them know is so critical? It says that if someone desires to follow Christ, they're going to have to deny themselves. The things you want are going to have to get put on hold. The dreams that you may have today may not be the dreams that God has for you tomorrow. Be flexible, be liquid, be open, be receptive, and be willing. Be obedient. Denying yourself is part of the Christian life. The next step in that ingredient of denying yourself is the need to pick up your cross. Christ isn't the only person with a cross. All of us that are followers of Christ are going to have our own crosses, our own challenges, our own ministries, our own callings. There, are, there is a group of people there is a part of a community. There are parts of nations that you're assigned to. That requires you, though, to have a heart for them, a burden. The cross represents burden. The cross represents victory. There is a victory. There is a shout. There is a cry. There is a trumpet blowing inside of you. There is words that need to be released only by you and you alone. Christ in you and Christ through you. Each of us have that need, that burden, that purpose, and most importantly, that power. Follow me. So three ingredients, denial, personal cross or burden, and followership. We all have to be followers of Jesus. Our job as Christians is to get other people to follow Jesus. If they're following us, it's because we're following our Savior. We're following the Savior. If people begin to follow us because they like us, but, if, but we're not, all roads are not leading back to Jesus, then we are off track. So understand that for the disciples and for you and I today, we're the modern day disciples. Say I'm a modern day disciple. Because <laughs> you are, you're a modern day disciple of Jesus Christ. And with that, what's going to be required? Denial of self. That means that you don't get things your way. This is not Burger King. You don't get it your way. We got to do things God's way. That's part of being under authority. If you want to move in power, you have to come under 
power. So we have to deny ourselves. There's gonna be things that you, you have the freedom to do, but you're not gonna do it anyway. Why? Because you're disciplined. Why? Because you're surrendered. Why? Because you're obedient. That's why you'll deny yourself. The second thing you'll do is you'll have a burden. A burden to go ahead and reach people. That means you're gonna carry a cross every day. Not every other day, but every day. And the last thing is you're gonna to continue to follow Jesus to the very end till he either comes back or you pass on to go be with him. It's so critical for us to be followers of Jesus Christ. It says here in verse 24, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. The reality is, is it, it's no longer your dream. It's no longer man's fantasy. It's no longer the social media uh, image of perfection, but it's Jesus' perfecting process through his image because we're called to be image bearers of Jesus Christ. So the truth is, is that when you lose your life, when you give your life to Jesus, everything is made new. You're healed, you're delivered from sin, you're deli delivered from the, from the punishment of sin because the Bible says the, the wages of sin is death and no more does death own you. We, today we get through Jesus to disown death and embrace eternity, embrace God's purpose, embrace God's love and embrace God's power today, not tomorrow, today. 25, for what profit is it to a man that he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost. What good is it for you to be the nicest person, the richest person, but not have the peace of Christ, not know Jesus, not serve Jesus? It's the greatest tragedy to, to be liked by man and never know the love of God. There's more to God. There's more to the kingdom. It comes with the embrace of the Father. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, we're talking to Christ to the disciples, whoever is ashamed... Of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's. What does Jesus' glory come from? Where does his power come from? Where does his dele delegated power come from or authority come from? The Father. Jesus always redirects the power, the honor, the glory to his dad in heaven. And it says here, but in 27, but I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Till they see the kingdom of God. I really believe today that God has not called kingdom arise, kingdom rise casually. That God has not called you to listen to this message today casually. Everything God does is with intention. This is a divine moment. This is a moment where God intersects your life and it reminds you that you're not just living for the next lifetime. He's giving you power for this lifetime. The Bible also says that Christ reveals to his disciples that greater works than these you shall do. What greater works can God do through your life? What greater works are you resisting God from doing through your life? The works of God, the miracles, the miracle signs and wonders, all of those are signs of our Christianity, signs of surrender, the signs or the evidence of our personal obedience. It's a reflection that we deny ourselves, a reflection that we carry our cross, and it's a reflection that we're followers of Christ. I want to encourage each and every one today to deny, to carry, and to follow. Deny, carry, and follow. This Mother's Day, the greatest gift that you can give your mom is to honor your Heavenly Father. The greatest gift that you can be to anyone in your life on this Mother's Day is to be a follower of Jesus and to be healed and touched and transformed permanently and eternally for Jesus. So today, you're listening to Kingdom Arise because you're wanting to follow Jesus. And with that, I want to close in prayer. I want to close in prayer and just speak life over each and every person today that they would allow the kingdom of God to arise in their lives today. Holy Spirit, we come to you. We come before you and we just speak peace. Lord, we put every sin, every transgression, every iniquity, we lay it at the foot of the cross and we put it under the blood of Jesus. This, we cannot do this journey alone. This journey was made for us to do it with you, Jesus, with you, Holy Spirit, and under you, Abba Father. Lord, I just speak your warm embrace over every mother, every mother that has cried and prayed, cried and prayed, through the late night hours, wanting their children to be saved, wanting their children to be protected, wanting their children to realize that they're loved by God. 
Lord, I speak to that person today that doesn't know your love. And I ask that you would just come in like a rushing wind, that you would just immerse, that you would just completely invade their lives with your love. And I speak over every mother tonight, every mother, that your prayers are not in vain, that your sorrow is not with kingdom gain. Lord, I speak the kingdom of God to grow in dimension, to grow in magnitude, to become real to every person listening. Clear up our ears, clear up our eyes, clear up our hearts, soften us. Let us glorify you. So I just speak strength over every son and daughter that's listening today, over every city, every family, every community, and over every nation. Lord, the world is going through birthing, birthing pains for kingdom gain. So power of God, power of God. Don't let us be transformers, but transform us as we release your power, love, and miracles in this generation. In Jesus' name, amen.